So <coughs> today I'm going to show you a little bit what we've done in recent years with LAV proteins in Drosophila. And in particular, what I want to focus on in the later part of my talk is on how uh, one of the target genes of LAV is involved in establishing synaptic connections and regulating the number of these synaptic connections. So as you all know, a DNA is transcribed under the control of transcription factors into RNA and then a protein is made. And for long years, the RNA has only been seen as a vehicle to bring the information from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And when I started doing my post of working on uh, RNA binding proteins, we became particularly interested in this step and how this is regulated and can con contribute to expression of proteins. So over the years, it has become clear that at the level of RNA, many steps can involve regulation. One of the first things to be regulated is editing, which is the change of single nucleotides. Uh, mRNA can also be methylated. It's been known for a long time, but only recently has uh, drawn some attention. Then information can be added or deleted through alternative splicing or pollination. Then the transport to the cytoplasm of a message can be regulated. Once in the cytoplasm, a transcript can be stable or very labile and be degraded. Transcripts can be localized, for example, to dendrites and uh, um, synapses. And once arrived in these locations, the translation can also be regulated. So it is only needed under certain uh, physiological conditions. So why we think post-transcriptional gene regulation is very important is when looking at the number of genes. So you see that the human has about the same number of genes as a little worm. But obviously, we would consider us much more complex than C. elegans. So somehow, there must be a difference um, coming from uh, how genes are expressed or organized that contributes for organismal complexity. And this becomes obvious when we look how genes are processed. For example, in humans, we find about 95% of genes which are alternatively spliced while in a worm, there's only about 10% of genes. And single cell organism like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, which is a yeast, doesn't have any alternative splicing. Alternative pollination seems to be more ancient and is currently annotated about 50% of human genes that have alternative pollination, but I'm sure this will increase over the next years as it was for alternative splicing, which people thought, oh, this is only an exceptional class of genes, and then over the years, uh, it increased to 95%. But what we think is that alternative pollination is more ancient because we find this also in uh, baker's yeast to be present. Then microRNAs is another class of, of uh, regulatory RNAs that have increased dramatically in numbers in humans. So based on this, we would conclude that post inscription regulation of the protein and its spatial and temporal control of expression increases with organismal complexity and likely has an important role in making uh, us human and how we can perform. So this is the reason why I've started to look into RNA processing. And we started with one protein called LAV. It's known from Drosophila and it's the abbreviation of embryonic lethal abnormal visual system it's just a brief description of the phenotype you find in Drosophila mutants. So null alleles are embryonic lethal and hypomorphs have uh, vision defects. Codes for an RNA binding protein, prototype RNA binding protein, three RRMs, one is a bit spaced from the other one. RRMs are very conserved motifs that recognize uh, RNA and is one of the most frequently found protein domains in the proteome. So one of these RMs binds about uh, three to seven nucleotides. And you could think that maybe adding one RM to another one and even a third one would make up the specificity. So how they would recognize a short sequence in the genome of 20 nucleotides that would be unique and make a binding site. But this is unfortunately not how it works. And I'm going to go a little bit into this later in my talk. The only thing we know so far that it binds AU-rich sequences, and these sequences are abundant in introns and non-translated regions at the end of genes. But how specificity is generated 
is not really known just from looking at these sequences because they all look the same. Okay, LAV is the funding member of a family of proteins. We have three in Drosophila. The other ones are Afinine, RBP9. There are four in humans, one in C. elegans, and LAV proteins are very ancient. They are also present in Hydra. The human homologue, which is closest, is HUD. LAV proteins in Drosophila are expressed in all neurons, here shown in an embryo, and they localize to the nucleus. And in fact, LAV HU proteins are very prominently used neural markers in metasome. And this is probably where you have heard about LAV HU proteins as neural markers. In Drosophila, LAV mutants have some interesting phenotypes. For example, in the embryo, we find that LAV null mutants have some exon guidance defects. Later on in larvae, we find that hypomorphic mutants have a very severe reduction in synaptic contacts they make at the neuromuscular junction. And we think that LAV has also a role in uh, regulating synaptic plasticity. And there is evidence from experiments in mice, uh, where studies have been done in HUD knockout mice, that uh, LAV proteins are important for processes in learning and memory, linking to a reduction in synaptic plasticity. Then later in the adult, we also find that LAV is required for survival of photoreceptor neurons. And this is where part of the name comes from. So LAV is localized to the nucleus in Drosophila. And also the human proteins are mostly localized to the nucleus. And obviously if you make a transgene, then we get full rescue of viability of a null mutant. Now, Yvonne Yannoni in Carpenter White's lab, where I did my postdoc, has discovered eight amino acids in this hinge region that, if deleted, the protein becomes cytoplasmic. And this construct doesn't rescue LAV null mutants. However, if this protein is put back in the nucleus with an NLS, then we get nuclear localization, obviously, and full rescue. So, through this experiment, we have argued that LAV proteins have their most important role in the nucleus, probably regulating alternative splicing, while the vertebrate field has mostly looked at cytoplasmic localization of uh, HU proteins and associated uh, LAV regulation with cytoplasmic events, like stability. I think, meanwhile, the common consensus is that LAV proteins are gene-specific regulators and they probably can do various aspects in the regulation of mRNAs. So it's not process-specific. Nevertheless, we focused on nuclear events where LAV is involved and identified LAV as a gene-specific regulator of alternative splicing. So we looked at a number of genes that are alternatively spliced, but only identified a few. These are EWG, which is a transcription factor, neuroglion, which is a cell adhesion molecule, armadillo, which is also a cell adhesion molecule and involved in transcription regulation in the wingless pathway, and LAV also seems to autoregulate. All these genes have uh, human homologs, and LAV does gene specifically regulate some alternative splicing event. Now, in the future, or in the, in the following, I have focused on the transcription factor called EWG. And the reason for this is shown in the next slide. So, what we found is that in LAV mutants, which normally are dead, that we can rescue these to become viable animals. And we can do this if we allow uh, embryogenesis at the permissive temperature and then switch to the restrictive temperature. So these animals are fully rescued, also they still have some phenotypes. But based on these results, we would argue that uh, at least EWG is a major target for LAV to provide uh, organismal viability. So this is how EWG is regulated. It has two regions which are alternatively spliced, and what I'm going to focus is on the end of the gene. So, if you remove LAV from photoreceptor neurons, <coughs> like in this uh, eye disc, then we also see that EWG is not expressed, but still the cells are there when positively marked. 
So what this means is that if LAV is present, we also get EWG protein. And we have found that this expression of EWG protein is associated with splicing of the last intron. If LAV is absent, then all transcripts pollinate at this poly-A site and no EWG protein is made. For some reason we don't understand, uh, transcripts that terminate here don't make a protein. So this needs to be translationally suppressed. But as we said, we don't understand that. We looked into the mechanism, how LAV regulates this alternative splicing, and we found that a number of LAV proteins bind in the vicinity of the 3 prime processing site, and LAV binding doesn't compete with recognition of the poly-A site, but rather the two core pollination factors, CPSF and CSTF, seem to bind with LAV. And this binding, in fact, is required to suppress splicing with little exon I. And altogether, this complex inhibits splicing of exon I, 3 prime processing, and then merely by default, we think we get splicing from H to J. So, one question that uh, we weren't able to answer is, uh, how does LV become a gene-specific regulator? Because the sequence that we find here is something we find in almost every intron or every untranslated region. It's just AU rich. And we got interested, how does LV make a gene-specific regulation out of this uh, very degenerate sequence? I mean, obviously, we would think uh, that, well, the primary sequence probably is the most important contributor to LV uh, defining it as a gene-specific regulator. But if you think twice, you come up with other ways of how you could generate gene-specific regulation. So, for example, there could also be RNA structure involved. Then LV could bind in a single protein or in combinatorial binding that could make the binding site more degenerate. Uh, in human systems, there have also been shown that factors are recruited at the promoter travel along the gene with PAR2 and are deposited. Obviously, such a mechanism would greatly reduce the complexity of protein phases. And eventually, also proteins could be localized to different cellular localizations. So all these mechanisms could uh, make a, a, a sequence be recognized in a specific way without being confronted with the entire complexity of sequences in a, a, in a cellular context. So one of the experiments we did is we wanted to test if LAV can bind its binding site in the heterologous context. So we made an artificial gene using the LAV promoter, uh, just a little gene we've been working in the lab, and then we put the LAV binding site into the 3' UTR. And indeed, we could uh, IP this sequence, this RNA, to show that LAV can bind in there. If we mutate this binding site, then we're no longer able to pull this down. So LAV is binding to this sequence in a heterologous context. Now the other experiment we did is using a slightly different reporter, which is a rescue construct. So this will rescue uh, lethal null mutants of uh, EWG. We changed the promoter from the LAV promoter to some other genes which are expressed in neurons in the same pattern, in the similar strengths. With the idea to test if the LAV promoter has something specific in it that makes LAV uh, be recruited to this gene. And much to our surprise, we didn't find much of a difference. So ruling out that LAV is recruited to the promoter. So from this, we can conclude that the promoter doesn't have a role in recruiting LAV, at least not in this context of EWG. Also, because it binds to in a heterologous context to its binding site, and we have transgenes in different genomic localization, we can exclude that cellular localization is contributing to a large degree to uh, uh, LAV binding. So what we're left with is, is it the primary sequence or some RNA structure, or is it binding of a single protein and or combinatorial binding? So this is the binding site of LAV, and it extends 
about 170 to 200 nucleotides, contains several U-rich motifs. We have identified this through UV cross-linking assays in nuclear extracts from fly heads, which obviously contains LV. And we found that it specifically binds to this region, but not 5' prime and not 3'. Prime. Also, if we add this region to an in vitro substrate for a cleavage assay, then we could show that this is sufficient and necessary for in vitro uh, cleavage and polydilation. So clearly, LV binding to this 170 nucleotide is important. So what we then looked is in how LV is binding to this region. And for this, we did EMSA experiments using either full-length LV or a truncated fragment, which deletes this AQ rich region not involved in RNA binding. Use this RNA uh, as radio labeled substrate, and you can see if you add either the truncated form, we get a shift to a slower migrating band or the full length, and LV forms a saturable complex. There are some intermediates, and you can tell probably LV binds with more than one molecule. However, if we made deletions in this substrate, we did get a reduction in affinity, but either we get this complex or we get no binding. So illustrating that an inherent property of LV is binding as a multimeric complex to RNA. And one thing we were interested in is obviously how many LV molecules are in this complex. And for this, we made use of this faster migrating complex and titrate it with the uh, slower migrating complex. So if you do titration of these two proteins in a mixture, then in one complex we have the fast migrating complex, in the other one we have the slow migrating one, and in between we have a ladder of different bands. Each of the bands represents an exchange of a larger molecule or of a smaller molecule with a larger molecule. When we count this, then we come up to about 12 uh, LV molecules that bind in this complex. We have a number of other biochemical evidences for LV forming a dodecameric complex on this RNA, at least in vitro. So in chair filtration experiments, the complex has a size of about 700 kilodalton. So this is exactly the size of 12 LV and one RNA. We also did stoichiometric titrations. So well above the dissociation con uh, concentration, if we bring the two together, then we need about a ratio of one RNA to 12 LV until we form the complex. And we got the same result in the titration experiments I've shown you before. Then LV binds RNA as a complex or it doesn't bind. Also arguing that LV needs to form uh, this complex to bind. In addition, we could also show that in this complex we see there's only one RNA present. So it's not just an accumulation of proteins on RNA that makes this uh, a complex. In solution, we find that LV forms a tetramer, and this tetramer seems to change into dimers when the complex is assembled. So there's some rearrangement involved when RNA uh, is bound by LV. So obviously, if you have a complex that has so many LVs in there, we would kind of expect that in the binding site, we would get a representation of binding motifs. So normally, how we would address this is using a CELEX experiment. But with a binding site of over 200 nucleotides, we probably would need a truckload of starting material to be representative. So instead, we looked what Mother Nature has done and looked at species that are very closely related. Now, in this instance, it's not important what is conserved, but rather what is not conserved, because this tells us what is not that important. And what we can see is that we find a number of deletions in areas that seem not to be that important. And when we look at the sequences left that are U-rich and are well conserved, we come up with six short U-rich motifs, which we think are important. Now, to show that these are important in vivo, we obviously... <coughs> so these are the six U-rich motifs we found. So to show that these are important in vivo, uh, we made mutations. And we made mutations in either this area, this area, or this area, termed either M1, M2, or M3, and put the mutations in a reported transgene and made transgenic flies. Then, to assess 
splicing we use an RNA protection uh, uh, approach, which is the gel here shown. Now the band to look at is this one. So this is the spliced fragment. And what you can see is, obviously in the wild type, we get splicing. If you put in mutations only in the M1 or M3 area, you don't see much difference. Only if you put in mutations in two areas, M1, M2, or M2, and M3, we see a bit of reduction. And only if we put in mutations in all these U-rich motifs, then we largely abolish splicing. So this clearly indicates that multiple AU motifs are important for, either for LAV splicing regulation in vivo and argue that potentially also a complex uh, could form in vivo to regulate uh, this splicing event. Now, if you had a complex form in this sequence, we thought that maybe if we put in spacer sequence, a complex would be able to compensate for such insertions. And this is exactly what we found. So if you put in spaces either in A, B, or C part, we don't see much difference, arguing that potentially also a complex could uh, compensate for these insertions. And importantly, these insertions also argue against any secondary structure, because obviously such insertions would disrupt such a secondary structure. So, when we look at our table, what we think is contributing to LV binding, I think we can rule out that RNA structure is important because if we put in spacer sequences, they would disrupt the structure, and so this didn't have much of an effect. We also found that LV is not binding as a single protein to this binding site, at least in vitro, and through mutation analysis, we would argue that combinatorial binding is important. So we have an extended stretch of primary sequence where LV binds, and this would involve combinatorial binding to overcome uh, redundancy and degeneracy of the primary binding site. So the motifs that are important, we found, are short, AU-rich motifs. There are multiple motifs involved, and they can also be spaced. So there's a large degree of flexibility. So based on this, we would argue that the LV binding site probably would diverge evolutionarily very fast so that we wouldn't even recognize it by simple sequence alignment. And we wanted to test if uh, such a sequence can remain functional but diverge through evolution. So for this, we use Drosophila species, Drosophila virilis, which separated about 60 to 40 million years ago, which is about the same distance as mice and men. What we see here is that the RNA binding part is identical. And this is part is sufficient to rescue LV null mutants. This part is Drosophila specific, but is not needed for this type of regulation. And LV is also expressed in the same pattern in the nervous system. So the protein is identical. Now we're looking at the RNA and the gene, if this is first regulated in the same way, and how the sequence uh, diverges. So looking at the splicing pattern, we find that this type of regulation is present in heads and, and, and thorax, which is neuron-rich, but not in neuron-poor abdomens. So this is a simple test just to say that this is likely a neuron-specific event, and the gene seems to be regulated the same way. But the surprise came when we looked at the primary sequence. So here you see the exons. They normally tend to be very well conserved because of, of, uh, <clears throat> of the open reading frame. Introns tend to be less conserved. But when we look where the LV binding site is, here there's almost no conservation. And we cannot even align it. If you look at the sequence, well, it's somewhat U and pyrimidine rich, but these modules have changed their position. If you do a binding assay, it still binds, but normally these in vitro binding assays are not that selective as situations in vivo. But it does bind, binds as a complex, and we have several intermediates. So we wanted to test if this element is still functional. So we took this piece from Drosophila virilis, put it in a transgene, and express it in Drosophila melanogaster. And indeed, this sequence can fully rescue uh, splicing. So, Joseph Lavillier's experiment gives us the same amount of splicing as does the wild-type 
to sort of lamellar Gaster-Wahl type element. And obviously, this is uh, responsive to LV. So if you remove LV, we don't get splicing. So this sequence is fully functional in vivo. So we then did a binding analysis, introducing mutations, again, in either one, two, or three parts of the RNA, and testing for in vitro binding or processing in transgene. And basically, we found very similar results we found in Drosophila melanogaster. So again, we need mutations in more than one part, and only mutations in all parts abolishes splicing, as you can see here. So what this argues, again, is that this area is functionally very well conserved, but we cannot align it. So these modules in position have switched. So what we conclude from this part is that LAV regulation tolerates massive sequence degeneracy in its binding site. Based on this, you would argue that post transcriptional regulation by LAV HU proteins is likely much more conserved than indicated by simple sequence alignment. So what we currently think is that the key to target specificity is certainly one part of it is the sequence. So there's some secret in the sequence, but on top of that, we think that it is also important how the proteins form a structural framework on the RNA that determines the importance of each of these short motifs that's contacted and bound by the RNA. So in order to make predictions of uh, the relevance of a sequence, we not only need to look at the sequence, but also on the proteins that bind there and what structural framework they build on this sequence. So this is where we're currently focusing on and looking into the structure of LAV complexes and how this transforms to LAV binding. So in the last part of my talk, I'm going to uh, switch gears to a slightly different aspect. And this is uh, what the function of this splicing event is or what the function of EWG is in neurons. And since EWG is a major target of, of, of LAV, we think this is a major contribution to LAV-regulated gene networks in neurons. So EWG is a transcriptional regulator. It's expressed in neurons, transcendently in de developing flight muscles, and hence this is what the name came from, because hypomorphs have erect wings and are flightless. They are homologs in vertebrates, also in hydra, but not in C. elegans and yeast. So probably C. elegans has lost its genes. But in zebrafish and also in Drosophila, uh, NIF1 is highly homologous. So it's 92% identical in zebrafish to the human one. So there's a very high degree of uh, conservation. Drosophila protein has gained an additional exon. <clears throat> but the, part, the rest of the protein is very well conserved. So, a first step in looking into a function for a gene normally is looking at the phenotype. And this to start with wasn't very informative. So it was embryonic lethal, okay, it's essential, but beyond that it doesn't tell us much. The morphology seemed normal. They were unable to move. And hypomorphic alleles have erect wings. So a bit Better insights in what EWG could do came from looking at uh, microarrays, looking for differentially regulated genes. And one class of genes we found is a few genes that could be associated with synaptic growth and function. And this is very well compatible with this phenotype as genes that are defective in some form of synaptic plasticity have a very similar phenotype. So obviously, if you wanted to look at synaptic plasticity, uh, which is done in a third instar larvae, this is a larvae. Uh, when we open this up, then we see a very stereotyped pattern of muscles and neurons. And these connections here from these neurons to the muscle, you can see these little blobs. So these are the sites of transmitter release, and they're very stereotyped. They are very repetitive, and we can quantify this. So this is a very straightforward way to look at forms of synaptic plasticity in this Drosophila model. Obviously, one uh, 
difference is that we need to have viable larvae. And I'll come to this uh, in a second, how we generate those. So there's very little known about the gene expression programs that direct the expansion of synaptic growth. So obviously what we see in uh, the first insta larvae is that neurons have made contact to the muscle and there are a few synapses made here. During larval life, this uh, structure will expand to its final size to, much, to match the muscle size. And obviously also uh, match a neural activity. And this is something that also happens in uh, forms of structural plasticity, so that synapses need to be expanded or retracted. And so we thought to use a Drosophila model and look into uh, how synaptic growth is regulated from the presynaptic side. Now for EWG, because this is embryonic lethal, we need a genetic trick to get viable larvae and we thought to do a clonal analysis. So we, We've come across a construct where the LAV promoter drives the EWG cDNA in neurons and this rescues the animal. Then we placed FRT sites flanking this EWG cDNA and then a GAL4 uh, transcriptional activator from yeast afterwards. So if you induce recombination by inducing a pulse of lipase, then we get rid of this cDNA and then the LAV promoter will drive the GAL4. And this will positively mark the neurons. So you can see here staining in photoreceptor neurons where EWG is expressed in all neurons except for where the clone has been induced. And this will induce uh, GFP expression, so uh, driving uh, through a US construct driven by the GAL4 transcription factor. So this way we can visualize neurons that are defective of EWG and analyze uh, clones in otherwise normal animals. So what we found is when we analyze such clones is that in EWG mutants uh, we get an overgrowth phenotype. So it's about 50% more synapses that we get in EWG mutants. Uh, we can rescue this with uh, EWG transgene but also with a human homologue. Synapses seem to look normal by looking for markers of periactive and, and active zones. So we think that is merely the number that's effective in this mutant. We can also overexpress EWG here with an inducible system and we get a reduction in synapse number. So because we can do this in clones and we couldn't do this presynaptically, we think that at WG restricts synaptic growth, cell autonomacy, and basically is a control to balance uh, stimulatory signals to restrict synaptic growth. So obviously we wanted to look a bit into more details, so how EWG mediates this synaptic growth and learn something about the gene expression programs that are behind this biological process. And so what we wanted to do is a system level uh, genomics approach to study the expression and how we do this is with microarrays. Then we also wanted to look at expression patterns of all the differentially regulated genes and eventually take mutants in all the genes that are differentially regulated to see if they have uh, defects in synaptic growth. So this is the data that we will get. Obviously we want to do some sort of validation using uh, biochemical assays to test for genes that are differentially expressed. We can do genetic interactions or protein-protein interactions or eventually look at transcriptional targets. And what we want to obtain is a, a regulatory network that works in synaptic growth regulation and get some insights into the principles that operate in this biological process. So when we looked at microarray experiments, we found coincidentally the same number of genes that are up and down regulated. However, what we found is that upregulated genes mostly consisted of genes involved in metabolism. While the ones that were downregulated, to our surprise, were not what we would call neural genes, which would mediate the phenotype. What we found is 
that most of the genes are involved in regulating some aspect of gene regulation, like RNA processing, transcription, or chromatin remodeling. Still find considerable amount of genes regulating meta metabolism, but only very few that we would think would regulate the remodeling of the neuron. So this was very surprising. The metabolic genes we could validate uh, by doing a biochemical assay for uh, a glycogen because some of the uh, glycolytic pathway genes are differentially regulated. So for these experiments we took whole embryos, so some of these effects could also be indirect and these genes could be expressed in many different parts. So to test for this, we looked at the expression patterns of all the genes that are differentially regulated and this was greatly facilitated by work from uh, uh, the Joseph Villa Genome Project, which have already done a considerable part of this, and these pictures are available on Flybase to the community. What we found is that for the downregulated genes, we found about 86% of genes are actually expressed in the nervous system. So this is a great proportion. While of the ones that are upregulated and are mostly metabolic genes, we found only a small portion expressed in neurons. So we think that actually the genes that we found differentially regulated are relevant to regulate synaptic growth. And this was further supported by looking at mutants in these genes that are differentially regulated. So at that time when we did this, there were about mutants in 50% of genes available. Now the amount is, is considerably higher, really allowing this type of approach. And what we found is that uh, about 80% of mutants in these genes that are differentially regulated, they had uh, synaptic growth defects. And rather surprisingly, most of these genes are again <coughs> excuse me, involved in regulating uh, some aspect of gene expression. If you look at how these uh, mutants uh, fall in different classes. Rather surprisingly, what starts as a linear pathway then splits into EWG upregulated and downregulated genes, and then we find mutants with more or less boutons. So I'll come to this point a little bit later and how we think to explain this, but it is clear that probably these genes that are differentially regulated become different inputs that can determine differential activity of these genes. So, still, this was somewhat surprising that we find so many genes involved in differentially regulating gene expression that affects synaptic growth. And we wanted to uh, look at this differential regulation of these genes from a different angle and see if we could validate this uh, by a different experiment. So, we've been looking into alternative splicing regulation of the EWG gene, and we made transgenes of different isoforms. And it happened that the one which excludes exon D and J, that this alternative isoform had a reduced viability. And it also happened that they had a synaptic growth phenotype. So it would provide viability, but it wouldn't rescue the synaptic growth phenotype. So in these mutants, we still find increased synaptic growth. So we thought that we would look at the genes that are differentially regulated from a transgene that completely rescues to one that rescues only viability but not synaptic growth. The difference between these genes should tell us which ones uh, are involved in synaptic growth regulation. Now when we compared these different expression patterns, then again we could see that those ones involved in uh, regulating gene expression are most prominently rescued with the one that also rescues the synaptic growth phenotype. So again, arguing that uh, genes involved in regulating gene expression uh, mediate the synaptic growth defect. Now, do these genes have something to do with each other? Do they form a common pathway? Now for this, we focus on this class of gene which has the same phenotype as EWG, that is more uh, boutons in the mutant. Now, if they would fall in the same pathway, 
if you make mutants in two genes and they would act independently, we would get more boutons. So we made double mutants of these mutants and tested for the number of boutons or possible combinations. And with none of the combinations, we found more boutons than we had in the single mutant, arguing that these genes do not act in parallel, but rather are somehow connected. One of the genes we found in this class is Groucho, which was named after the famous actor from the Marx Brothers because of these bushy eyebrows the mutants get. And so we tested if any of these genes interacts with Groucho in either enhancing or suppressing this bushy eyebrow phenotype. And to our satisfaction, all of these genes interacted with Groucho. Again, arguing that these genes act in a common pathway. Now, remember, before I showed you that we have uh, genes that are upregulated in EWG mutants, but then if you look at the phenotype of these uh, mutants, we get ones that have less and more boutons. So arguing that we get different inputs, probably from signaling pathway, that could relate in a different output. And this is further supported by this gene here, Groucho, that is regulated both through wingless and notch signaling pathways. So we thought that probably EWG might be at uh, a hub that regulates different inputs <coughs> of cellular signaling and determines an output in how many synapses are made. So what we wanted to test is if EWG interact with known signaling pathways involved in synaptic growth regulation and also with notch because it differentially regulates uh, Groucho. Now this again was made possible because of this uh, construct which allows us to analyze EWG function in single clones, in single neurons. So through this approach we're not dealing with the viability of mutants as we can use the GAL4 in the LAV mutant to either overexpress or RNAi certain compounds and test if then we get an interaction with uh, EWG. So first of all, we just tested uh, or validated if wingless overexpression results in more growth. This is mediated through uh, pangolin, the TCF homologue, which acts in the nucleus downstream of wingless signaling. You could also find that notch signaling has an effect on synaptic growth regulation. Uh, AP1 and TGF beta had previously been shown to have a role in synaptic growth regulation. Now, what you can see here, if we overexpress AP1 in EWG mutants, we can get even more boutons. <clears throat> so arguing that this pathway is either in parallel or it's downstream of EWG. And if we use a dominant negative, we can see that this effect is largely abolished. So this would argue that AP1 is downstream of EWG. We also found interference with TGF beta signaling and mingless and not signaling. So that this interaction are somewhat epistatic and intermediate and less clear of how they interact. But what overall these results tell us and what the take-home message of this slide is that none of these signaling pathways act independent of EWG. So EWG is somewhat connected with all these signaling pathways in determining how many synaptic contacts are made. So based on this, we would argue of our model that we have several cellular signaling pathways that regulate synaptic growth. But these signaling pathways, they do not act independent and do not have their own complement of target genes that would regulate some aspect of synaptic growth. But rather, what our experiments argue is that these signaling pathways uh, come together in a transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulatory network that would somehow determine an output in regulating effector genes. So effector genes would be those genes that are at the end of the regulatory hierarchy and would remodel uh, synapses. And based on 
this uh, regulatory network, it would be determined if you get more or less synaptic growth. So, I'd like to close here and thank the people that have contributed to this work, mostly Imgard Hausmann, uh, did the work with the synaptic growth regulation and t technician previously in the lab, Min Li, was involved in looking at evolutionary conservation of uh, EWG regulation in Drosophila virilis and recently I started to collaborate with Klaus Futra looking at structures uh, of LAV complexes which I haven't talked much about here and obviously also the funding we have from various agencies. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>